Well, good morning. Good morning, Johnson Ferry. This is one of my favorite places, and uh, I'm just delighted to be here. I, when uh, your pastor, Clay, when he asked me to come and speak, and uh, I said, well, yeah, I was, yeah, I'd love to. I was just here not too very long ago. He said, yeah, I want you to come back and see if you can get it right. So, and it, <laughs> no, he didn't say that. So good to see you here, my bride. She's coming in the next service, but it is a joy and a blessing to be here with you. Uh, I've got a long ways to go and a short time to get there, so if you have a Bible, a device, or an extraordinary memory, uh, I'd like for you to turn with me to, to the Old Testament, Genesis chapter, chapter 2, Genesis chapter 2. Just leave it open there for a while. I know that we prayed earlier, but let's pray one more time. Holy Father, we thank you for your love and mercy. God, we thank you that you have been so, so extravagantly good to us. Um, we're ashamed of those times in which we kind of cave into entitlement and selfishness. We thank you, Father, for all that you've done. Now, Lord, I pray in the name of your Son that you'll arrest our attention. I know that my friends here and brothers and sisters, they don't need to hear my feeble attempts at articulation. But we need to hear everything that you have to say to us. So, Spirit of the living God, speak, we pray. Take us from where we are to where we need to be. Um, even if that's uncomfortable, ultimately it's for our good. Uh, do your work in and through us in Jesus' name. Amen. Karen and I will celebrate our 52nd wedding anniversary in May. And... Uh, I tell her all the time that she deserves combat pay for being married to me that long, but uh, uh, she is the absolute joy of my life. We met in college, and I got to tell you this story here. Um, the summer between my freshman and sophomore year in college, uh, about two weeks before I came back on campus, I broke up with my high school sweetheart. Well, the truth of the matter is she broke up with me. <laughs> she kicked me to the curb. I need sympathy. Oh, there you go. That's it. Can you imagine somebody getting rid of all of this? But uh, <laughs> you said, yeah, I can kind of see that. But at any rate, I was, this is a true story. I was back on campus. I was first day back. I was in my dorm room on my knees praying. True story. I said, God, I need to take a break from women. I'm hurting. They mess you up every time. I need to stay focused on you and me, Jesus. We're going to be focused. I'm going to stay focused on my studies and my relationship with you, and I'm not going to be distracted or deterred or disrupted in any way. You and me. And I got up off my knees, and uh, people who know me know that once my mind is made up, I can be fairly focused. And so I started walking down the street to the main, one, one of the buildings on campus there, and uh, mine, you know, rehearsing this deep-seated stalwart, single-minded commitment not to be distracted, but stay focused, you're hurting, buddy. And I get to one of the buildings on campus, and I open the door, and I step inside, and I see this young lady that I hadn't seen before. And I don't know what happened. I just got healed instantaneously. <laughs> it was gone immediately. Don't tell me God doesn't heal today. And uh, so I, I, my mama taught me to be hospitable to strangers. And so I went up to her and I introduced myself. And I said, now, what's your name? She said, Karen Williams. I said, well, you know, I've been assigned to you. Uh, I'm going to be your tour guide. So... <laughs> I've been showing her around now for 52 years. Actually, she's been probably showing me around, but uh, that's, that's the deal. It's easy to go to weddings and forget that a marriage is taking place. We celebrate the transaction, although don't get me wrong, we, we the beautiful bride and the starry-eyed groom and all of the wonderful things, they look sharp and beautiful and Go to the reception. All of the stuff is just really great. And uh, you spend a lot of money. I married two daughters, and thank God I didn't have more girls. But at any rate, uh, you know, you, you go through all of that, but you forget that a statement is being made. In fact, the marriage ceremony is the last holdover from the ancient covenant ceremony. And the word covenant comes from a Hebrew word, bereth, 
sacred, solemn, binding agreement. And what you're actually witnessing here is a legacy handoff. What do you mean by that? Well, marriage and family in the Bible, hear me, is the sacred conduit by and through which the plans and purposes of God are passed on from one generation to the next. So your marriage is not just about you. My marriage is not just about me. My family is not just about us. My marriage, this is astonishing, is designed to tell the truth about God. And that's what's happening. You see, perseverance and endurance is always found in the why and not necessarily in the what. But we gravitate toward the transactional what. But why? Why? What's God's design for marriage? Whenever, whenever you, you, you want to find out why something was established, particularly biblically and theologically, uh, there's something called the law of first mention. You go back to how it was first mentioned, when it was introduced, and then you discover the why. For example, you want to know the why of the church, you go back to Acts chapter 2, the last paragraph, it tells you how it started, what happened. So this text in Genesis chapter 2, verses 18 through 25, is a masterful piece of scripture. For it introduces the why of marriage and how it all got started. This text is a, it's like a great piece of classical music that builds to a grand crescendo and finale. There's a progression here in this passage. And I want to I walk, you, walk you through this progression. I want to hang some meat on this brief outline. There's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a need. God creates a need in Adam. Then there's a painful discovery. And then there's a specific provision. Then there's a glorious declaration. And then it ends. It ends by describing God's design for marriage or a commissioning statement. The very first thing is that there is, there is a need. There is a need that's created in Adam. A need. Listen to these words in verse 18. Then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. And since I'm going to spend the bulk of my time on the last piece there, the finale, let me just make some quick summary observations here. First of all, you need to understand the context here. Everything up until this point, God said was good, was good, was good, was good, was good. Then he looked at Adam. He says, not good, buddy. <laughs> yeah, and wives are going, yeah, I told you that. Uh, not, not good. Not good that you would be alone. Now, what, what you have to understand is, is that, that, that this, this need that Adam has was obviously created by God. And this need... This need that Adam has is not a product of the fall of mankind. It's not a product of sin. God, this is astonishing. God creates man with an unmet need. An unmet need. He says, and I, I, I will make a helper suitable or fit for you. Not to get too granular here, but the expression helper here, it's, it's been ambushed and misused. And some lazy preachers have, have kind of, you know, uh, suggested that somehow or another, uh, a woman or wife, your wife is, is sort of like a, a mega assistant to you. Well, that's not necessarily what this word helper implies here. This is the same word that's used of God. God is called our helper, our helper. And uh, it's not a demeaning expression Neither, neither is it meant to somehow downgrade the position. It might be best understood that, that I will make an empowerer for you. Just as God helps us. God's not weak. He gives us strength. 
This is to dignify the role of a wife and not to diminish it. I will make you a helper fit. Fit. Um, um, that, that word actually means more appropriately corresponding to you. Corresponding to you. Two, two implications. Uh, one is that he's talking about the sameness. Sameness. Uh, the, the same thing that God said of Adam in verse 7, then the Lord God formed the man of the dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living soul. What he's saying is, 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 is this. Look, look, look. I, you, you're, you're, you're no less than he is. Just as he bears the image of God, I'm going to make an empowerer who bears the image of God, corresponding, corresponding to you. That expression also implies one who fills in the gaps. One who fills in the gaps. But Adam, you ain't got that now. That's the dream. Now, the next step in this progression is a painful discovery. God wanted Adam to feel, not just know it, but to feel, to feel that need. And what does he do? Well, he gives him an assignment. We know the story here. Um, verse 19, now out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. Here you have it. Here you have it. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. Obviously, the ellipsis here in, this, in, in, the, in the whole deal is that, that Adam is alone, right? And so God so, says, okay, you have this assignment. I want you to go and name all these animals. And naming all of the animals, he discovers that, yeah, there's two by two, same but different. There's companionship here. But I don't, I don't have that. And he feels it. Feels it deeply. God is deepening the desire and longing in his heart to be complete. And then at the right time, we have the third step in this progression. God's specific provision. I love this. So this is a remarkable. Verse 21 says, so, so, the Lord God caused the deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, he took out one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman. And brought her, brought her to the man. Now, I don't want to play with this too much, Adams, in a deep sleep. And I don't know what he's thinking about when he's sleeping. Maybe he's rehearsing all these animals that he's named. Maybe he's thinking about everybody's got somebody, but I have nobody or whatever. The emptiness that is there. But while he's sleeping, God is doing surgery on him. And what he does is that he... <laughs> He makes this woman, the word translated made here, actually could have been translated more specifically, built. I like built better because it, 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 uh, it hints at design. Uh, it, it's like when you want to build a building, he, you get an architect uh, that draws up the plans. In other words, God's provision was not haphazardly put together. Specifically designed 
for Adam's aloneness needs. And she, she, she was built to fit him again, corresponding to him, the same as him, but to complete him, to fill in the gaps. And then the text says, and God brought her to the man. Don't miss the language there. He brings her to the man. Implied in this is a mystery presentation. Adam wakes up. Perhaps he hears rustling. Maybe he's saying, did I forget an animal? And he sees this form, this figure. And God says, Adam, this is for you. It's almost as if Adam says, I guess God says, I got something for you, buddy. Um, how do you like this? How do you like this? And then there's this glorious declaration. That's the next step in this progression. <laughs> Unmet need. Painful discovery. God's specific provision. And what does Adam say? When he sees Eve, he says, hey, well, that's nice. Verse 23 says, then the man said, <laughs> this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, and she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. My dear friend, Dennis Rainer, the founder of Family Life, we, we go back many, many years and used to do these Family Life conferences together. I used to love to hear him when he would wax eloquent on this passage. He said, when Adam saw Eve, he said, whoa, man. <laughs> that's corny, I know, but that's, you know, that ain't exactly how she got it. But anyway, he said, she's now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. What was he saying? He's declaring oneness. We belong together. He's welcoming God's provision. It's as if he's saying, this is the beginning of community. The beginning of life. And now we come to the final statement, the summary statement here. This is the declaration. This is the commissioning for marriage. This is the sacred, eternal application of I do. This is what it means to be married. And I would say to you, I would say to you, most marriages that fall apart, they fall apart because of a failure to keep these three commissioning statements. Thus, we have God's design or the commissioning statement for marriage. Verse 24. Therefore, therefore what? Reaching back in context, looking at this whole progression, how God presented the woman to man. Uh, 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 she, was, she was built for him. It says, therefore, a man or woman shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked, and they were not ashamed. This text tells us that there are three decisions that equal three realities. Marriage was meant to be a picture in an applicational, transformative way 
of leaving, holding fast, and becoming one flesh. That's the summary of marriage. That's the commissioning of it. That's the expression of it in human nature, in, in, in humanity, in, in human history. And I just want to touch on each one of these three things. They, they, they are both decisions that need to be realities. In fact, this outlines a lot of what I, when I was passionate, used to say in premarital counseling. And I would spend a lot of time on this. Because the dysfunction in your marriage is a failure to do one of these three things. The very first one is this. God says, if you want to have a healthy marriage, <laughs> then it begins with the decision to leave. To leave. And I think the implication here is to leave physically. Is to leave Financially, is to leave emotionally. Or in other words, in other words, uh, there has to be the establishment of healthy independence. Please forgive me, I'm a little bit too old to do recreational speaking, so I'll say this clearly. Young couples... If you don't want your parents in your business all the time, stop inviting them into your business. You can't have it both ways. You, you have to leave. I, I'm not saying in a cold, cruel way. Obviously, we, 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 we love our parents, but a new relationship has been established. That's what this means. There's a new relationship here. This is the primary relationship here. And there's got to be independence in this relationship. Hear me on this, and maybe I'm getting too granular here, but I, I tell young couples this all the time. Listen, listen, listen. Everybody needs help from time to time. You know, all this economy and all the other stuff, you might need some help from your parents financially. Maybe some stuff is happening. You might need to move in temporarily with them or, or whatever but don't revert back to being their child before you were married. When you do that, you, you own the responsibility. You take the initiative to suggest a date in which you'll be able to leave. And if you borrow money from your parents, you take the initiative to do all that you possibly can to pay it back. Or if they want to forgive it, fine. But don't, don't assume that you're still the 18-year-old or the 15-year-old or the 13-year-old. You're grown. Then I would say to parents all the time, don't give your married children unsolicited advice. Well, what will happen if they fail? Well, they'll know not to run back into that brick wall again. See, the deal is this. Everybody's going to be very dead one day. Everybody. So why do you want to inject dysfunction in the relationship? The greatest gift you can give them is to help them to be independently dependent upon God. To be the portrait of, of, that, of that destination. And over-dependence, over-dependence, over-dependence on parents, I, I tell you, will rob you of the strength you need as a couple to greet your future and to forge your own legacy. Out of struggle comes strength. Stop making decisions because you have a safety net. Marriage is like a long train ride. When you say, I do, you realize that you did, and you got, you're in this car and this train, and the, you have children, and the children start filling up the car, and their friends start filling up your car, and their activities start filling up your car, and you got colleagues at work and profession and things that you're doing. The car is really full right here. Parents, all these stuff. But there's a tipping point. At a certain point, 
kids graduate from college. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> they leave. Friends start leaving and dying off. Folks start getting off at the next stop. And there you are. The way you started. Just the two of you. The condition of that relationship is predicated on your choices back here to leave and to turn to one another, which is the second decision. The second decision, one is to leave. And leave means what it means. Go, get out. Secondly, hold fast, hold fast. What, what does that imply? Well, uh, it, it, it's, it's the tacit realization that marriage does not take place in a protected environment. There are forces out there that want to sabotage your marriage. They want to sabotage your relationship. And because of sin in our own lives, we will sabotage the relationship if we're not careful. And what, what is being said here, what God wants us to know, is that there's no relationship on earth that is more important than the relationship you have as a couple. None! And if you make your children more important than your spouse, then you're sowing dysfunction in them. There's no relationship in life that's more important. And the holding fast means that I intentionally nurture that. It also implies that I set boundaries around that. It means that I don't let any other woman get closer, close to my heart other than Karen. Nobody occupies that place. But you don't let any other man Occupy the place. You hold fast. It means that you, you, you honor your covenant relationship. Listen, for years I traveled. I was on staff with, uh, Karen and I were on staff with crew for 27 years. I traveled and spoke on university campuses and this kind of thing. And I remember, you know, in those early years, budget was tight. And so I had to stay on the road a little longer than, uh, you know, I would do today. And I would be in some, some college town and a motel there and I thank God somebody encouraged me to do this I had this habit as soon as I got to that little motel room I'd pull out of my briefcase this picture of my family and I'd stick it on the mirror so when I leave that hotel room I would look at that and say don't do anything stupid and I'd come back and I would think these are the most important people in the world. Hold fast. Hold fast. Health in your marriage is intentional. It's more than feelings of love. It's making decisions that I'm not going to allow relationships or other things sabotage and eradicate my covenant commitment. And God says, no, 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 Adam, 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 Adam. This is it right here. This is it. This is it. Holding fast also implies that um, a healthy interdependence. Listen. I know, I know that all of us, you know, we're, some of us, we're strong people. We're independent. We're, you know, we're bootstrappers, and we've been successful because we've made good choices and decisions, and I, you know, I take care of myself and all of this. Uh, not really. All of us got married because we're needy. Stop lying. <laughs> we got married because we're needy. And you shouldn't run from that. 
We have a need to be loved and it is show love. We have the need to be needed and to share. So sticking to one another means I, I need Karen. She needs me. The third commissioning statement that is also a decision is the becoming of one flesh. The becoming of one flesh. Uh, the verse says here, and they shall become, they shall become, they shall become one flesh. I, I realize that this implies, uh, you know, <laughs> those of us who speak at these kinds of marriage events and this kind of thing, Every once in a while, I think we overemphasize. Now, sexual intimacy is terribly important in marriage. And it is a consummation of marriage. And I would even say it is the expression of oneness. But the becoming of one flesh here means so much more than that. It means so much more than that. It means the, plum the plummeting of intimacy with one another. It actually implies... That, that to be married, when, 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 when Adam says, she's now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, it, it implies forging a, somewhat of a new identity together. It's the mystery of marriage. I, I used to tell young couples this all the time. If you're not willing to change, then don't get married because marriage of necessity means change. You will change. It's not a bad thing. And it means to become, become one. For, it, intimacy is the ongoing, growing, knowing. It is, it is a process. It is responding to one another based upon the tragic twists and unpredictable nature of life, the suffering that happens, and all the other stuff. We're going to cling to each other. And I, I'm going to know her. She's going to know me. My parents were married for a long time. They were married so long that they started looking like each other. <laughs> Even though they didn't look anything like each other. My dad, he, you know, my mother was about this much taller than my dad, but to his dying day, he declared that he was taller. I said, Pop, come on, man. And he said, well, you know, when you go old, you, you shrink. I said, you've been shrinking for a while, buddy. And uh, so... <laughs> Uh, the different personalities, totally different in every way. And doggone it, they were like, they could, well, they could communicate without using words. What a sweet thing. And I find myself, I'm a, Karen and I are getting like that now, which is scary. We even go into restaurants and sharing salads. That's not a good thing. And so... <laughs> You start looking at it like each other. Because that's all you got. And God says, yeah, it's all you need. Yeah, it should be all you want. One flesh. I tell this story in Land of Plain. One of the most difficult things in my life was to find my dad, uh, he, you know, uh, he, got, he got sick. He had congestive heart failure and a number of issues, and, and to see him go down physically. He was the strongest dude and the most hardworking man I've ever met in my life. My, my dad played baseball in the old Negro Leagues. He was, just, he was just, I mean, he was just a man's man, and I just think he could do anything. And I'll never forget this. A couple of months, two, three months before he died, I was up in Roanoke, Virginia. This is where, that's where they re had retired, helping them with some of their affairs. And at this point, we had sold the house because uh, mom had uh, bad arthritis and it, she couldn't manage the big old place. And so they were living in a, an apartment. And uh, I was staying in a bedroom next to theirs and... Uh, for some reason, the bedroom door was open, and it was like 1.30, 2 o'clock in the morning, and I just couldn't sleep. So I was laying there, and my dad was moving very slow at this point, okay? 
And I overheard, I overheard my dad say to my mother, oh, Sylvia, I'm sorry. I couldn't make it. What had happened was he, he had to go to the bathroom, but because he was moving slow, he had an accident. Listen to what my mother said. She said, Crawford, that ain't nothing. We're married. I'll clean it up. I laid there and the tears were trickling down my cheeks. It was almost sacred to hear that. We've been married so long, there's nothing in you that's going to embarrass me. If you're uncomfortable, I'm uncomfortable. We're in this thing together forever. You want your marriage to tell the truth about God. You want to model and give hope to your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren. You don't want to turn on one another. You want to turn to each other. And Jesus can help you. He died on the cross in our place and for our sin. He lives on our behalf. And we can draw from the life of Christ to overcome the corruption and the crud and the crap in our background and the dysfunction. We're all dysfunctional. But if God can raise a dead Jesus, he can give you and he can give me everything I need. And you got to believe that. Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for this wonderful institution of marriage. And may our relationship with one another, our marriages, may they tell the truth about our great God and his plan and purposes. In Jesus' name, amen.